Um, so today we're going to talk about how Trimble is using real-time, uh, providing real-time freight visibility with NIFI and SAM. Very much seems like a big NIFI conference, so if you guys like NIFI, you're going to hear more about it. <laughs> oh, that one. So a quick overview is, the, for the agenda today, is we're going to talk about the transportation industry, what the problem is we're trying to solve. Um, how we're adding visibility to that transportation industry, and then give some reflection on the work we've been doing with HDF, primarily some on HDP, to kind of talk about what we've learned along the way while using NIFI, while using SAM. Uh, we, we do have a safe harbor notice, so basically Trimble, makes, Trimble policy is, you know, we want to be able to talk about some of the stuff we're doing that's not generally available, so if you're a customer looking to buy software, we may talk about stuff that's future release. Um, uh, so a quick overview, I am Donnie Wheat. I'm the senior big data architect with TMW, which is a company within Trimble. Uh, been working there for 13 years on optimization, business intelligence, data warehousing, data integration, and the big data solutions. I'm Krishna Patluri, and I'm a big data architect at TMW Systems. So Trimble itself is a very large company that it seems like almost no one's heard about. So a quick overview, you know, their motto is transforming the way the world works. Uh, they're heavy into agriculture, into construction. Um, they're the brains that take these caterpillar giant tractors and are able to plant seeds with very specific GPS locations with no driver driving. Uh, and then our division is transportation. Uh, so very much focused on freight moving throughout the country and across the world. So what is the transportation industry? We focus heavily on the US. Every country is different. Uh, we've got some operations in Australia, some across Europe, but our concentration is mainly on the US. Um, so a little bit of terminology along the way too. Uh, so as part of TMW, our customers are carriers. Uh, these are the people who you see the trucks on the road. They're moving freight. Uh, they have drivers. Um, they're, they're moving goods across the countries. The people that they're serving are shippers. These are the people who own the freight that's in the truck. Uh, it, just out of curiosity, anyone here in the transportation industry? Got about four or five, okay. So you guys are probably familiar with a little bit of this. Um, so what we do is our traditional c customer is that trucking company. Well, how important are trucks? Well, they move 70% of freight across the entire country. So these are ATA numbers. Um, even when you start to think about things like trains, um, well, yes, everyone sees these giant trains. It seems like every year they add four carts to it to where we sit longer at the train crossing. Um, but what that does is if you look at the freight on a train, you'll see a lot of bulk stuff. This is coal, this is food, this is the stuff that gets moved from a, sh a shipping yard directly to a consumer. But then you'll see a bunch of trailers. Well, those trailers actually create two trucks in the equation because someone's got to pick up that truck trailer and deliver it to the train. And then once it reaches the other side, it generally has to go on another truck. Uh, so trucks are heavily involved in all parts of this. Um, the big thing we've seen is shippers want to know where their goods are. You know, we're all very used to, I've been using Uber a lot here. You pull up your phone, you say, I want an Uber to show up. You sit there, you see the driver's face, you see the car they're in, the license plate, where they are, and the fact they'll be here in five minutes, right? That's what shippers want. Uh, shippers want that visibility to be real time, to know not only where they'll be right now, where they are right now, but where they're going, what time they'll be there. Um, it's a little complex. Um, there's a lot of regulations around drivers. We don't want drivers driving 23 hours a day. I think everyone agrees upon that. Um, but there's a lot of complexities that say, well, if a driver's moving freight, he has to stop for 30 minutes breaks. Every few days, he has to stop in, uh, for a long-term break. Every night, he needs to get a little bit of sleep overnight. So there's various complex rules in all the countries about how this freight moves and when it'll actually be delivered. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to factor all that in. We want to know what the driver's doing. We want to know what the weather is. We want to know what traffic conditions are and give as real time an estimate as we can to the shipper about where their goods are and where they'll be. As part of that, we purchased a company called 104, who's now part of the Trimble family, that focuses heavily on giving that shipper that visibility of here's where your freight is uh, and here's where it's going. Um, a lot of trucking is still dependent on old technologies. There's still a lot of customer interface, which is great, it's good to know your customer, of 
calling up and putting in an order manually. Uh, a lot of companies use EDI. EDI was developed in the 1980s. It's an electronic data format where they're sending messages back and forth. When we talk to shippers in terms of visibility, what they normally see is we know it picked up, we know when it delivered, but we have no idea where it is along the route. Additionally, trucking companies, these carriers are focused on trucking. Uh, they're not big IT staffs. They're usually mom and pops. 93% of trucking companies are 10 or less trucks. So they're very small companies we're dealing with. So when we call them up and we want to talk software, they're thinking about trucks. So from a shipper's perspective, everything's getting more complicated on their side. So they've got freight coming from overseas. They've got freight coming from the U.S. There's a lot of just-in-time stuff where, particularly like the auto industry, they want to make sure that they don't have a bunch of metal just sitting around. They have this goods flowing in and getting to the point of consumption when it needs to be there. Um, so, so what does this traditionally look like? Again, a lot of manual customer service. So people are talking to each other, people are calling each other up. Uh, drivers' main point of contact has been primarily calling them up on a phone recently. Um, more and more they're getting into where they're entering stuff via um, in-cab units, um, but there's still a lot of manual input. Nothing proactive. So in the past, carriers have bought software to where they can see when their trucks are gonna arrive sometimes. Uh, they may not have the software, uh, but it's been mainly focused on them seeing where it is. More advanced carriers will provide shippers the visibility that says, hey, log into this portal, see where it is, but it's not proactive. It's not, it, it, it's not that real-time solution they're looking for. Um, and lots of stale data. When, when we first did this integration and provided data through our 10.4 interface, they said this was the best data they've ever seen. They've never seen pinging every hour, every five minutes. Um, so we're able to start providing them the type of visibility they want of where their truck is and put it on a breadcrumb for them to where they can see it. All right. So where do we start? Um, so actually when I started trucking t or transportation software 10 years ago, it was interesting because trucks ping maybe one time an hour. So as of 10 years ago, you might know where a truck is, assuming he's not in a part where cell phone coverage doesn't work or he has some trouble with his satellite reception. Um, but now we're to the point where we're regularly seeing every three to five check calls, which is position events, every hour to see where the truck is. Um, we're, we're looking at providing them geofencing. So it's important to know when a truck is at the customer. Now frequently, you might get to a customer and you might have to wait in line for a position to drop the freight. Um, with the newer tools, you can actually see, all right, he's at the customer, he's just sitting waiting, he's not docked. Um, he, he, it, it, it's, it's in process, but it's not there. That dynamic ETA, so it's based upon um, what your hours are, what you're doing, when you'll be there at a specific time with accuracy. Uh, and the models get complex. If you're going across US and Canada, you're following two different sets of rules, and both rules may apply at different times. Uh, really what we want to get to is proactive to where a carrier can know or a shipper can know when something's going to be re late and they can do something in advance. They can either get another tractor out there that might be able to get it there sooner or they can just call up the customer and say, hey, it's going to be late. Uh, let's, let's get this resolved before it's late and the customer is just calling up and yelling. So the technical requirements. So, so what we're looking at is, you know, a lot of the data we deal with comes from a database. Um, our customers have their, their transportation system in their houses. Uh, the applications are generally older. Uh, so they have a screen up where they're editing a grid, and that's writing queries directly to the database. Um, they have business logic that's built into the databases. So our point of contact for a significant amount of data was the database. But we wanted to make sure that we, you know, we had our vision of where transportation is going, which is everything streaming. When you look at the data coming from the trucks, they're coming off an event bus, a message bus. So it's data that's telling us where the track is uh, as it's happening. So we wanted to have the same approach, whether we were dealing with database data or whether we're dealing with um, message bus data or hitting web services. Um, so part of our tool selection, the reason we picked NIFI is because it's all about streaming data. Um, the other thing we wanted was rapid deployment. And what we found is we could have NIFI flows up and running within days when we knew nothing about NIFI 
and we can make significant progress and changes within hours to days once we knew it and we understood what the capabilities in knife AR. Uh, so the fact that you sit down in front of this nice UI, it's got 200 different uh, processors you can pick from and you can start to flow data and make it work was something that was very attracted to us uh, in terms of getting it to where we could get this uh, pr process moving quick. Uh, the other thing we wanted was, you know, we wanted to grow the production system with the customer. Uh, so we've started, we've reached the point, we've got about 50 customers on the system, but we want to make sure that we don't have to walk out there with a 100-node cluster. We want something where it's easy of, we've got 50 customers on the cluster, when we reach 150, we might add an extra node, right? So we can scale that up and down as needed um, without having to have that big initial investment. So kind of the process approach we took is first, we wanted to do the heavy work on our side. Uh, our customers have overloaded databases. They're very busy. We didn't want to sit there and have to go, okay, um, we're looking at this order. Well, this order exists across 40 different tables because an order has a pickup location, a delivery location, has a driver attached to it, has a tractor attached to it. Um, so there's all this related data within their systems. And our traditional approach is, they would write heavyweight applications that would run complex queries against their database to produce EDI. We didn't want that. We wanted to make it easy for the customer to where we're not impacting their database, they can go about their, their transportation business. Um, so what we did is we identified those key tables and elements we wanted, and we were able to, through configuration, identify, here's the data we want to collect. Um, a key part of this is we didn't want to have the data pushing constantly. Uh, some of our customers are in rural parts of the US where they don't have um, Silicon Valley level of fiber to the curb, it's not unusual that we're dealing with, dot, not dial up, but um, with DSL, with cable technologies that are slower. And then on our side, we don't want to process stuff that we've already processed or there's no changes to. Uh, so we had to be aware of what data changes. We did some profiling of our customers' data. Our average customer touches about three to 5% of their data per day. Because uh, the reality is in the life cycle, you know, an order comes into the system, they work it, they, they get a truck on it, they complete the order, they build the order, and then they're done with that until they might do some accounting or some other reporting later. Uh, but they're not generally changing a lot of data. Um, so, and the other thing we wanted to do is we wanted to give the customer the power to say, how frequently do you want these updates? You know, if you're gonna send us your data, you want to do it every hour, that's great. Every 15 minutes, we're great. The standard we're doing is every 15 minutes until we get to more streaming data, which obviously we'll get as it comes. Um, so what we do then is once we have the fact we know maybe just a stop change on order, we're able to then on our side do lookups, do data correlation, and do, do data enrichment to start to understand what that order truly is. Uh, the other key for us was we wanted zero touch for the clients. Um, already in the first four months of its life cycle, we've added new features that required new data from new tables and new columns. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that even though we've given them a very simple install that takes 15 minutes, we didn't want to have to call them up and say, we need more data um, to make this work. Can we run that installer again? Uh, so what we've done is we made sure the client is able to communicate back to our system and be told, here's the data to collect. Uh, so we can add new elements without having to involve installation. So what are the estimates? So the estimates is uh, the team looked at all the trucks that are running uh, Trimble ETS software, and they determined there's almost 3 million trucks uh, and a little over 3.5 million drivers, um, ultimately resulting in about 1 billion estimated GPS events per day. Um, so if we were tracking every, trucking every truck that, that was being touched by a, a Trimble software, it's a tremendous amount of trucks every day. Um, so again, starting small, uh, these numbers were taken about a month ago when we were about 30 customers. Uh, we're currently tracking about 100,000 trucks, uh, a little short of a million GPS events per day. Um, and we kind of have two approaches. There is, we need to look up data. So when you first uh, come and install the software and work with us, we load a good amount of your data. We say, we need all the order details. We need all this stuff so we can look it up later. After that, we take the approach of, we're really just looking for those check calls and any data updates 
so that we can then adjust our view of that order and then uh, tell people about what's going on with the order. So if all goes well and we continue onboarding several customers a week, we could have as many as a million and a half trucks being monitored by the end of this year is our high projection. We'll probably be somewhere in the middle. Um, it would be a very high success if we had a half million trucks um, being tracked by the end of this year. So what are we running? We started with a three node NiFi cluster and four HTTP machines. Uh, very small cluster, maybe the smallest in the room. Um, but for the most part, since we're very careful about the data going into the system and coming from the customer, we're only seeing about three million records updated per day. Um, this is for the data as we're doing that ongoing. There's a slight difference in when we onboard them, we see an initial glut of data. So it looks like about on average 100 million records saved, um, sorry, 9 million records saved per day um, for that initial data set, just so we can build an understanding of their data and we don't have to communicate that data every time. Um, so what we found is on average, once a check call comes out of our Kafka cluster and needs to be processed, it's taking about just short of 700 milliseconds to process that check call. So that is determining what order they on, determine the stops, look up all the detail, enrich the data, format into a message to send it to uh, 10.4 for visibility, and then it's out the door. Um, most of that time is actually consumed by SQL Server. Uh, what we found is we have two problems with our SQL Server. First is we're not using any sort of caching engine, so we're just constantly hammering it. Um, that was just to get out the door. We're looking at adding caching to replace that. The other issue we have is our SQL server was determined to be co-located in a different data center. So just moving to the right data center, putting cache in place should take out another two to 300 milliseconds worth of time. Um, with NiFi, the one thing we did that 47 millisecond Phoenix save on average is we didn't want to write any code. So we have a JSON objects come in and it gets upsurged in Phoenix. We don't write any code whatsoever. It's just a single NiFi flow. It's about 10 components uh, that will take in the JSON message, determine what table it belongs to, do a metadata lookup on Phoenix to determine what the columns are, do a mapping to create the upsert, and, and save to Phoenix. That takes about 47 milliseconds per record. Um, so it's very efficient in terms of we've not had to write any code. We add new tables. All we update is metadata. In, in our, our target DDL, and that data is saved into our system, and we don't have to touch it, and it takes 47 milliseconds per record. So what is our architecture? Um, so we're relying heavily on the HTTP platform. Uh, one thing we've taken the approach of no code. There's plenty of code to be written if we're able to use tools that do stuff for us. Uh, that's one of the things we liked about NiFi is it's a tool. We're in there, we're writing data flows. Um, drag and drop, you can put comments in individual processors, you can put comments in your workflow. Uh, so we heavily document what we're doing. So someone who wants to know what this NiFi flow is doing can just read the code, real readable. Uh, Kafka is another key. Uh, so everything comes into the system via Kafka messages and it's also there's a couple articles out there on Hortonworks about how you scale NiFi. Kafka is one of the keys and important ways of doing that is um, for each additional NiFi node, you add new partitions and suddenly each node is uh, processing data. Um, Phoenix and HBase are our storage mechanism. Uh, Phoenix just makes it so much nicer to go to HBase. We made sure we did salting of all our data because the reality is the source data is not very HBase friendly, but the salting features of Phoenix have made that, are that very nice and easy to deal with composite keys and, and data uh, hotspots to reduce the hotspots. Um, in terms of HBase, we're also running a replication of that. So we've got our operational system, which is working serving up data, and we've got that data replicating into a, a data science HBase to where our data science team can dig in, run nasty queries and not affect our production system. So we're, we're seeing some good work through there. Our ultimate goal is to get into Hive to where they can do whatever they want, uh, a little bit easier to use database, um, but that will be for our data science team to make use of. And again, we're, we're looking at what caching engine. We've initially started with Ignite because we like some of the features it has in terms of data persistence as well as data caching. Uh, seems like from this conference, a lot of people are having good luck with Redis. Uh, so we're really starting to evaluate what is our caching mechanism gonna be there. 
In terms of the front end, this is where we put most of our code. So we've got our services that are able to manage configuration and inflow of data and drop it directly into the knife IQ. Um, so th that's something that also ties into our Trimble identity. Um, so this is basically, we are able to track which of our customers this data belongs to. And again, our customer is generally a, a carrier that has trucks, but when we're talking with 10.4, it's a shipper, and we want to make sure that we see this visibility across the whole system. We'll kind of get into our, our MDM approaches a little bit later. On the analytics side, uh, the first thing we use is Zeppelin. Uh, Zeppelin we use to do troubleshooting and identifying, you know, what's wrong with why an order is not being sent for visibility or not being augmented correctly. And really what that does is it allows the developers to define, you know, when we have to troubleshoot data and talk with a carrier or shipper about why the data looks incorrect or it's not being sent, uh, this lets us build out what the report should look like so that we can then hand it off to the UI team and the data services team to actually build the full UI for people to interact with. Um, the data science team is heavily involved in Python. Um, so they're, they, play, they worked with R, they worked with Python. Python made it easier to put code into production and get things up and running, so they went with Python. And then on the legacy side where we do spit some of our reports into a traditional um, data warehouse, uh, we leverage Power BI just because it works very friendly with SQL Server and data warehouses. So what are we doing with NiFi? So the first thing is we do CRUD operations. So it handles all of it for us, it reads the metadata, it understands how to save the data, and it moves it to Fingas. Um, we've taken heavy advantage of the expression language. So we're trying to drive most of our, our augmentation and changes as much as we can by configuration. Uh, so we're able to read configuration into attributes and make use of the expression language to determine what table this should go to, uh, what process this belongs to. Um, so that's made it very fast and friendly. Uh, another part of NIFI we've enjoyed is uh, the Jolt processing with the JSON. Um, this is a library that's moderately documented on the internet, but it basically will let you take one version of JSON, output a different version of JSON by a JSON formatter. Um, so we'll do things like, uh, we'll inject configuration and metadata into JSON using this, again, just by writing a little piece of JSON code. Um, so for the most part, we've tried to avoid custom components. We kind of have three levels of how we evaluate components to use in NiFi. The first is things that are easy. We try and use stuff off the shelf. Um, when our processing gets moderate complexity, uh, the first thing we look at is there's some script tabs built into NiFi. Uh, so can we write a script? that will perform an operation in, within NiFi without actually having to go write a bunch of code. Uh, the use case for that was, you know, we, we have a little complexity of the data in that a truck might have 10 orders on it. Well, we might only need to tell one customer about one of those orders. Um, so Krishna was actually able to break in the script tab and say, okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna identify um, that there's 10 orders on this and we're just gonna split that flow file into 10 different versions, and then you can look at each individual order and say, all right, does this customer need to be informed? Um, so very powerful processing within those script tags uh, that lets you do fairly moderate complexities. Anything that's more complex than that, we're still evaluating other options. Uh, currently looking at SAM, which we'll talk about later. Uh, we have currently have a services team. So when it gets really complex and really difficult and you start to have your your NIFI workflow look like you're going in 18 different directions. That was when we say, we're probably stretching the mounds here. Um, we did write one custom processor. Uh, one of the things, again, we like is we like to read configuration, not into flow files, into memory, because it's very fast, and to do data augmentation. Um, so we did write our own custom processor that you could basically throw a query at. It would, hit, it would connect to the database pull it into an attribute, and then you can operate on it. Um, and it made our flows very simple of we didn't have to worry about the standard uh, get SQL that would put in the flow file. It'd be straight to memory, and then we could operate on it. So once that was done, uh, one thing we had to spend a lot of time on was optimization. Not a lot of time, but we, we learned very quickly that optimization is important. Uh, especially when you're going from development to production or changing your production sizes. There's all kinds of controls within NiFi about how many concurrent processes you want and how you want to distribute that across the cluster. Um, so what we learned is 
like everyone loves to do, we got in there and said, all right, we can turn up concurrency. Let's turn it way high, and it did nothing. Well, what we, what we found was, well, we turned up a processor. Well, there's a system level that says you can only have 50 concurrent processes. Uh, so once we got that in place, we started to say, all right, well, we'll turn stuff up higher. And we found there's really a balance. You got to make your workflow work, especially on a or smaller cluster. Because simple things like we would say, all right, we're trying to save to NiFi, or we're trying to save with NiFi to Phoenix, uh, have 40 threads saving to Phoenix. Well, our database connection pool is only 10 threads. So suddenly we had 10 people competing for 40 and things are blowing up. We're like, well, that's not very smart. All right, so we figured that out. So we went there and said, all right, now we've got plenty of database connections. Let's crank it up to see if we can get stuff into Phoenix faster. Well, it got slower. All right, why did it get slower? Well, what we found out was there's contention, right? So we've got one resource of Phoenix. It's four machines. It's working real hard. But you're suddenly telling one part of your NiFi flow, go in there and interrogate Phoenix, figure out what this table looks like. And down the road, you've got another part saying insert in Phoenix. So Phoenix is now very busy serving 80 different threads trying to do multiple things. Um, so there really is that balance you've got to learn and figure out, you know, in terms of hitting your resources, you can hit stuff too hard. It's not just turn it up and it all works like magic. It really is a balance. Uh, the other thing we found is we were writing very long NiFi flows. Um, so it almost became unmanageable. Obviously, with two guys in there, it wasn't as hard. But as we start to grow the team, it got more and more difficult. Uh, so what we determined is we really need to take advantage of more of a microservice architecture. We, we say, let's write very specific NiFi flows that do a very specific job and then th throw the ball down to any consumers who care. Um, so really, most of our NiFi micro apps are bounded by Kafka at the start, Kafka at the end, and then that allows us to determine whether the consumer of that is one flow, is it 10 different flows. It gives us the flexibility to control who's looking at the data without having to have forks that go in eight different directions and this unmanageability of a giant NiFi flow. Uh, we were still using process groups, so you know we would take one set of 20 processors, put them in one group, but it still just kept spidering out of control. Uh, so what we're really moving towards is having simple flows with Kafka. We're looking forward to some of the Kafka enhancements that are coming um, to really understand how we're using Kafka and, and what effect this is having there. But this has just made development easier. Um, so. so in terms of the other parts of the HDF application we're looking at, uh, Kafka's big. Uh, schema registry. Uh, we did an initial proof of concept trying to see if we could use schema registry to flow JSON directly into Phoenix. We had some issues in terms of some of the processors for record-oriented processing weren't exactly there at the time. This was an older version. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that's come out on record-oriented processing where you're using uh, schema registry uh, to make sure that you're handling your metadata about your data. And we're looking to get back to that and see if we can really proof that out. And then uh, we've also looked at SAM. Uh, Christian will talk in a minute about kind of what we found from working with SAM. In terms of HTTP, heavy Phoenix, heavy HBase, um, big thing we learned is it's still HBase under the covers, especially with our cluster being a little smaller. Um, so we had to make sure that we really looked at our queries to make sure that we're hitting indexes. If we need to add secondary indexes, we did so. Um, make sure that we had things uh, sequenced properly. So we spent a lot of time tuning our Phoenix tables and our HBase to understand how that works. Um, and then finally, we're looking at you know, how we move that off into Hive to where we can work more with the data science team. Um, so our one custom processor, again, was that we, we wanted to read JDBC results set straight into memory. Uh, that's actually very much sped up our time to market and also our processing power. So in terms of third party, our biggest thing was our data collector. Um, really need to be able to make sure that we are minimizing customer impact and controlling configuration. I uh, touched a lot on this earlier. Um, but the other thing is our key integration with Trimble Identity. Um, everyone's already got 8,000 passwords. I know I use a password manager, and it's shocking how many passwords you had. So we wanted to make sure that when we're dealing with our customers, we say, just log in with your existing Trimble credentials, and it'll be OK. Um, so that's used for authorization, both for them to go and configure the system and also for 
um, sending a data so that we can tag the data as it flows into the system. In terms of deployment model, uh, we are purely Azure, so we're in the cloud both for development and production. Uh, we use CloudBreak for deployment. Uh, the one thing we found with CloudBreak is that is the latest versions are spectacular. We actually did a mixed deployment to where we deployed an HTTP system and we put HDF on top of it. So NiFi went in, it's all in the same Mbari, and this is the time when Hortonworks is saying, that's coming later, we already had it in production. Um, so we've, we've seen a lot of good improvements there as, as CloudBreaks has, has grown. Uh, finally, on the services side, we're using microservices, um, Dockerized containers, uh, ESBs, and also an identity server to make sure that we can identify who it is and make sure no one's flooding the system. We get reports on API uses and, and can control the access to API from various customers in case there is a DDoS or something. Turn over to Krishna. All right. So before we talk about reflections, I just want to know how many of you guys are using Stream Analytics Manager? All right, couple hands, good. Uh, so one of my tasks was to evaluate Stream Analytics Manager and actually compare it with NiFi and make sure that if you're not missing anything. Uh, so as Donnie talked about NiFi, I mean, this whole conference is about NiFi, and out of the box, NiFi has every processor imaginable, right? You have uh, Ignite Cache, you can write Groovy scripts, Python scripts, you can call REST APIs, and pretty much everything there. Uh, so because of that, we were able to uh, put a, a client into production in 120 days from scratch, right? So we were able to deploy this application using NiFi. Uh, not only we use NiFi for our operational data flow, we also use it for analytics, where we collect data about how many shipper, how many check calls are for a shipper, uh, how many check calls are for an order, and then we can do reporting on top of that, right? Uh, so Donnie touched base upon the performance. Uh, again, we processed 100 million records in a day on just one NiFi, but obviously in production we have high availability for NiFi, uh, Phoenix, and Kafka. So the challenges again are that breaking NiFi into micro NiFi apps, otherwise it becomes a big mess of workflows and it becomes unmanageable. Uh, also, if you uh, went to George's talk, he talked about syndicate Kafka topics, and we use that, where we take multiple data elements from Kafka and join it in NiFi and push it back to a Kafka topic. It could be consumed by other consumers. Uh, Phoenix uh, had some issues where we have to manage security in HBase and join optimizations for complex queries. So uh, Sam, when I looked at Stream Analytics Manager in December, um, the straightforward workflow of taking data from a SQL server and putting it all the way through HBase was pretty straightforward. Uh, but when we, ha we already had a production NiFi uh, workflow going on there. So what I did was let me try to replicate that into Stream Analytics Manager. And obviously I worked with uh, uh, Hortonworks Commuters at that time because uh, it's really new, brand new product. Uh, so they helped me write custom processors. Uh, so we wrote, uh, they wrote a Phoenix custom processor and I took that as an example and also wrote a SQL Server custom processor. Basically these are lookup processors. They would take uh, lookup SQL Server data and enrich it and send it to the next one. I also had to write some JSON processors because there wasn't Jolt at that time in here, uh, and also some API uh, sync processors. Uh, so, so what ultimately we decided is that because we were in such a tight uh, deadline and we didn't have enough time to write custom processors for every single uh, thing in SAM, we went with NiFi. Uh, but had if we had more time, I'm sure SAM would be also a good use case for streaming this data into HBase. Uh, so these are all the custom processors I have, and I also have a GitHub link uh, I can share with you guys. If you want, are interested in writing custom processors, take a look at that, and uh, just you can use them as samples. All right, Donnie. All right, so one of the troubles we had was basically queries that we write against traditional databases were not working for us in Phoenix. And it, Spent a while profiling, trying to figure out. Uh, so when you wanted to join two data sets, you typically just write an inner join a join. You join the data, and magically you get two results. What we were finding is those times when we were hitting large data sets were querying out very quickly. 
so what we ended up having to do is say, all right, well, let's minimize the data set, right? That's a simple way to make most SQL Server happy. So we would do an in clause that basically said, sh you know, just get this small set of data, same performance timeout. Uh, so th the thing we finally determined was, all right, if we're going to be joining data sets in Phoenix, make sure to reduce the amount of data as quickly as possible. Uh, so we push the where clause into both sides of the join, and suddenly it's happy it's returning fast data. Um, so it's just one of those things of, all right, I get Phoenix is SQL, but you kind of have to learn as you're working with it that there's some things it does fantastically, but large data sets is where we've had issues. Hopefully as we grow our Phoenix and HBase clusters, you know, some of that was resolved just by adding more horsepower. Uh, but for now, we've just started to learn how to make sure to tune our queries and make sure they're, they're happy. Uh, the other thing we did was making sure that um, we could report and talk with our management about the actual customers. Um, so what we've done at TMW is we've spent a lot of time on um, master data management. Because uh, you would think that everyone would know that this is the Marriott. As we looked across customer databases, if you pulled this location, you would see the location of this building being halfway down the street, mostly clustered around one location, um, but customer databases are not really good about identifying what locations are, who companies are. Um, so as part of this, we've built into our flow that when we see customers that we're dealing with, whether it's a shipper or a carrier, that we're making sure to tag it, that data properly so we can see who's pushing us a lot of data, who's slow to push data. We're actually able to keep metrics on the database collection on their side to see what impact are we having? Because uh, our data collector is currently having about a, a three to seven second performance hit on the customer every 15 minutes. Uh, so we want to be able to make sure that, you know, since we're making this easy on the customer, if we start seeing, hey, suddenly data collection is taking three minutes, we're missing it. We're either, they're having issues with their database, we're missing some sort of index, but we can actually monitor that internally all the way up to management level where they can see all these statistics and understand what impact we're having on our customer, how quickly we're delivering data to the visibility provider, and, and how our system is operating. Uh, another thing we did is, is we kind of, since NiFi is so easy to write flows, we had our flow, data is moving to our, our visibility providers. Well, we wanted a report showing how much data was coming into the system each day. Uh, we actually ended up writing a few little, three or four little NiFi flows that with just 10, with just uh, four or five processors would run aggregate queries and push them into our SQL Server data warehouse. Uh, it was a little bit of combination of NiFi did most of the work. We wrote a little stored procedure that would go ahead and, and, and finalize and push the data into our star schema. Uh, but ultimately, NiFi made it super easy to take this data that's in our private data center behind a VPN and push into SQL Azure database and get that visibility all the way to our management. So where are we going next? Uh, so the next thing is we want better data warehouse integration for our data science team. So we want to be able to archive data, move it out, and still have it available for the data science team as they look at various algorithms for predicting which customer they're going to when there may not be full details on the customer they're going to. Um, full integration to some sort of cache mechanism, initially targeting Ignite, uh, but depending on performance there, we'll look at Redis and whatever makes sense. Um, Additional data sources, there has been a government mandate that says most trucks need to have a device on them telling them that the driver can report when they're driving, when they're working, when they're not working, what they're doing, so that they don't violate these regulations. Well, that's created up a litany of vendors, at least 100 plus, that are certified with brand new devices frequently on your phone to say where the truck is, what they're doing. Uh, so part of what we want to start targeting is there is... Uh, multiple different providers out there that um, we want to integrate with, and then adding additional visibility providers. And I think I'm getting the time's up signal. So if anyone has questions, we're happy to stick around and answer questions. Thank you.